That, so that's Munich malt, which is quite a pale malt. Okay. Um, so if you try some of that as well, you'll notice it's, it's again quite a little bit sweet, but it's obviously you can kind of taste the, the real difference between those yeah. two. We get roasted to develop color and flavors. Generally, the more the darker the color, the greater kind of um, in-depth flavor they've got. So, the, so you're talking more like your stouts with the darker grain. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it doesn't take much to get a, a significantly darker colour into the beer. Um, this is... Is it just a higher heat? Just um, a, a higher heat, exactly. So that's a dark malt, and obviously the other ones are a bit lighter. That's really good. Most beers would use kind of at least 80% of the pale malt. In fact, generally oh, most right. beers probably lose, use at least 90% of pale so, malt. So it's how you mix and match? How you mix and match the different, the different malts to achieve okay. different kind of um, shades of colour, if you like. So, so when you're designing a beer, do you experiment? Do you just have a day where you're like, oh, we're going to try some different Well, generally, or that's where the science comes in. Basically, you can get, I guess, 90% of the way there with the science because depending on how much alcohol we want will determine how much malt we need. So that's easily done. Yeah. Um, the malts also have a color specification so we can actually determine how much color we want by using different proportions of malt. So the science can get us kind of pretty much there as well with that. So you've already got a good idea. We've already got a good idea. And then for, so that's, that'll give us the, the sweetness if you like yeah. and the, the color and that background flavor of malt. Yeah. And then from the hops, we're gonna get the bitterness and some aromas and flavor from them. The first step in the brewing process is to get the malted grain into the mash tun. And the mash tun is a huge stainless steel tank filled with hot water about 72 to 73 degrees Celsius. As soon as that grain gets into that hot water, a, a reaction starts to occur and sugars are given off from the grain and different temperatures give different amounts of sugar. Now the difficulty is, is maintaining a really constant temperature. So the way they get it in there without the water cooling down is they take the grain, they put it in this container up here and they add a big long pipe going into the mash tun, which is down there. Now as the grain's going through the pipe into the mash tun, they also feed in hot, hotter water, which is around 82, 83 degrees, which cools down when it hits the grain to around 72 degrees. So the whole thing is maintaining this constant temperature so that the right amount of sugars can be released. I'm about to add the hops into the boiling wort mixture. And the hops are what give your beer a, a lot of the flavor um, in terms of the bitterness and the flavors and the aroma. And that is all dependent on how long the hops are at a certain temperature. So if they're at a temperature for this, this boiling temperature for a long time, you tend to get more bitterness. So, uh, whereas less time, you get more of the kind of the, the flavors and the aromas. So you do it in different batches. We do, this is a heat exchanger. And on one side of the plate, the wort will go down at 100 degrees Celsius. Yeah. On the other side of the plate, cold water flows through the plate. So by both of them being on opposite sides of the plate, yeah. the hot wort, will get cooled down by the cold water. Yeah, the heat travels from the... Exactly, the heat will transfer effectively yeah. from the hot wort into the cold water. Yeah. So the hot wort will, will end up being cooled down to 18 degrees, yeah. and the cold water will be heated up to between 50 and 60 degrees. A bit and like having cold water running through your engine to keep it cool. In exactly, way. yeah, yeah in, exactly. In your car. It will also give us water available for our next brew um, Oh, you know, that's heated up. That's heated up. Oh, okay, so, yeah. so actually, it's a very efficient way to heat up your water and because that heat energy without it dissipating. With, yeah, beer is quite vulnerable after we stop boiling I because see, yeah. at that point it's cooled down. It's not boiled anymore, and as we cool the beer, we want to get it in in next door as quick as possible and get the yeast on there as quick as possible because what the yeast does, once the yeast starts working, yeah. it will form a protective layer, if you like, on the top of the beer, so that will help to prevent any airborne bacteria from getting yeah. into the actual beer itself. And it will also create carbon dioxide, which again will help to build up a protective layer above the beer. So one of the if this job isn't done right, yeah. then everything else has been a waste of time. So in some ways, 
this is kind of the most important job. The oxygen is obviously bad for the beer because it will oxidize the beer and yeah. potentially cause it to have a limited shelf life and go off quicker than otherwise would do. So when we're running the beer into the, from the fermenter into the conditioning tank, oxygen is our enemy, if you like. So yeah. what we do is we flood the tank with CO2 first. And that CO2 is, is obviously heavier than air. So because it's heavier than air, than oxygen, it will drop down and it will push any of the oxygen further up the tank, if you like. Yeah. So once we've done that, we can then start to run the beer through into the tank. Now the beer is heavier than the CO2. Yeah. So the beer comes in from the bottom, pushes the CO2 up, and that pushes the air up. And basically you are essentially creating a top layer of, of pressure, if you like, a top layer of CO2, which will provide protection for the beer. The issue with casks, in a way, is when you've got them in the pub, I assume once you've opened them, you've exposed it to the air. Exactly, so yeah. Is that, how do you counter that problem, or is it just a case of selling the beer the, 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 as the way, as you can? Exactly. The way with cask ale, because it's not forced carbonated, there's no CO2 going in. It's just ideally sell it within three days, and yeah. that's the kind of lifespan you've got from when you tap the cask. In a keg, which is different, you'd have uh, the beer would be under carbon dioxide pressure. Yep. That is also carbonating the beer, that's adding the bubbles, or is that just to prevent the air from getting it? It, it would do, yeah. yeah. And, and it, it obviously means that, that it's not exposed to any air at all, yeah. so the product has a longer shelf life. We're going to yeah. do our final gravity check on it to see and then we'll be able to compare where the gravity was at first, yeah. so the original gravity, where the final gravity is, and then we can work out exactly how much alcohol we've produced. And so to clarify, the gravity is what you call specific gravity is... Specific gravity is density, density, I guess. Yeah. So at this point, we'll just take a sample. Yeah. And this is a refractometer. Yeah. So this is not the most accurate tool. We use hydrometers yes. later, but for this process, it makes it really easy. We don't waste a lot of stuff. And when you work with the hydrometer, you have to, to calculate with the temperature um, the, the sugar. The right, right. But with a refractometer, you don't have to worry about the temperature. Is that because it's measuring the light? It's, it's how the light passes through the sugar. So yeah, you just put a little sample over the, over the glass piece and kind of push it down, get all the air out of it. And so when you look through there, then you'll see how many degrees bricks are in there. So it's, it's about 14.2. So that's how we measure the beer. We take our starting point, how much sugar have we got at the start, yeah. and how much sugar have we got at the end. And then the difference we can convert to give us the alcohol by volume. So first what we need to do is we need to, there's a temperature adjustment, so we need to make yeah. sure, measure the temperature first. Uh, this is seven degrees. And that's because the colder the liquid gets, it gets more dense but as it heats up, it gets less dense. So this is a saccharometer from a scale of 1010 to 1020. The yeast basically will eat the sugar. In eating the sugar, it will then turn it into alcohol and carbon dioxide. So that's where, that's where our bubbles come from in the beer, the carbon dioxide, yeah. from the natural fermentation process. And so as you can imagine, as the yeast turns some of the sugar into alcohol, the density will get less and less and less because, because alcohol is less. Dense. Alcohol is lighter, exactly less dense than than sugar. Four point five percent is bang on the alcohol that we're aiming for for this beer. So that's great. We had the right starting gravity. We had the right final gravity, and that means that the beer is consistent with what we're trying to brew. A four point five percent best. Two types of findings. There's auxiliary findings and there are isinglass findings. Isinglass findings are basically, they're the main finding that will clear the beer. The auxiliary findings are something we add to the tank and they will help the clarifying process. They won't clarify the beer on their own, but they will just help to make it that more clear when we do add the isinglass. Yeah. The isinglass are essentially swim bladders from sturgeon. So it's, it's a fish product, fish if you like. Yeah. yeah. We usually don't like to advertise that fact. No. <laughs> um, and basically... Presumably that's not left in the beer when you're drinking it. No, because so. what it does is that it drops the yeast out. So at the yeah. moment, so when we add the um, finings to the cask, the finings will cause the particles of yeast to come together and form larger flocculations, if you like. So that's to do with charges? So that's to do with charges, charges yeah. The auxiliary is negatively charged, and I think the isinglass are positively charged, Either or the other way, way around. Charged, they're oppositely charged. They're oppositely charged. Stick together, yep. and that then pulls down the sediment. 
that will pull better. down the yeast, yeah. So it will cause the yeast to come together. So yeah. the yeast will clump together and it will form larger flocks. And in doing so, it will then be able to uh, drop out. Same. Exactly. So if I give this, this a shake, you'll see the yeast coming from the bottom and going back into, into suspension. So you can see there's kind of some reasonably large flocks there. Now they're only there because this has already been, been fined and been settled for a little while. If we take this one for example, you can see this hasn't cleared yet. It'll probably take another three hours for this one to clear. So the yeast is still kind of forming larger flocculations and then dropping down. So really, it's a process of, um, of the yeast coming together and getting larger, and you can see the larger bits are already starting to to fall down towards, uh, you know, the, by process of gravity to the the bottom of the uh, of the findings bottle. And this is done partly because people want a clear beer. Exactly. But also yeah. The yeast does affect the taste. I imagine. The yeast does affect the taste, but largely this is because people want beer that's clear. Um, they drink with their eyes as well. Yeah. Um, We hope you have enjoyed this video and for more videos go to freakphysics.com.